So, um, a lot of this code was put together about three months ago. You know, the versions of um, GCC and just their library for, for exit testing that I used. And I don't think a whole lot has changed uh, since then, so we think it's still work. The code excerpts are not 100% compilable because I've tried to just keep the, uh, the salient information on the slide. So just pretend that the appropriate includes standard qualifiers, using directives, and all that are there. Um, and work with all those things. Edit. So a little bit of history. Uh, C++, of course, began with Garzustra, uh, C with classes. First original standard, 1998. Uh, in 03, a bug fix update was released. No major changes to the language, just cleaning up some of the, some of the standards. For the rest of the presentation, I'm going to refer to pre-C++11 as old C++, just as it's easy to say. And um, in 05, TR1 was released. The library committee released a set of specs for library components that, will be, that would be in the final C++ OS, aka C++11 uh, language. So folks had many years to, to get used to this. So of course, a lot of them came from Boost. Uh, C++11 finally ratified in August of last year and made it official. Next step, maybe a next um, library interim release, TR2, 212 in 2013. So primary goals, uh, this primarily comes from uh, Bjarne's write-up uh, on his website and uh, other discussions of it. First, make C++ easier to teach, learn, and use. So um, there's facilities for shortening the syntax, for eliminating some ambiguity, uh, making it more clear. Probably the single most um, significant feature of the language that would work toward easier to teach and learn was actually dropped from the standard, and that's concepts. Hopefully we'll get something like concepts in a future version of the language. Um, but that simplifies the you know, error messages from working with templates dramatically. Um, and so for now, we still have to do with error messages. Maintain backwards compatibility. Um, always important. Um, one of the challenges of, of standard committees is to incorporate new features without breaking code that exists. So um, you know, that's been done for the most part. A few little things like the auto keyword you know, won't do what it used to do. Nobody's going to miss it. Uh, but generally speaking, that, that goal is going to achieve. Improved performance. So one of the problems with old C++, call it that, is that certain things are expensive to do, copying of objects specifically. And uh, a lot of effort was put into uh, essentially allowing the language and the libraries to work together to facilitate more efficient um, transfer of data from one point in memory to another. Avoiding copies when they're not absolutely necessary. So that's a big piece of language to use semantics. Strengthen the library building facilities just uh, by adding new keywords to make, uh, make it more precise uh, when you specify from a base to a subclass what sort of things is the subclass allowed to do, what should it do, what shouldn't it do. Um, we'll see how a lot of that was rather ambiguous earlier on and has been cleaned up considerably. Interface more smoothly with modern hardware. I kind of see that as a euphemism for support concurrency, uh, which is what modern, modern hardware on mobile devices, et cetera, is really clamoring for. And that's probably one of the most important So Bjarne says the pieces just fit together better than they used to. And I find a higher level style of programming more natural than before and as efficient as ever. A little understatement there. I think it's actually more efficient. All right, so let's start off with the simpler uh, language features. Auto keyword decal type, no pointer, range for, uh, improved syntax for templates, and well, using them all. So let's take a look first at, a C, at an old C++ um, function template here. Not necessarily the most useful thing in the world, but it serves as a nice example of uh, how old C++ could be on the wordy side. So here's a template called find all. Its purpose is given a container. Um, find the first element in it that is a null, and it assumes it's a container of pointers. So it's going to return an iterator to that first element that is null, or it will return the end iterator, which is usual for um, when something isn't found. Note that you can't really call this an algorithm, right, because it takes a container rather than a pair of iterators. So just think of it as a function template to serve some particular useful purpose. So first thing, um, 
we have a declaration of a variable to hold the iterator. And this is kind of wordy. Um, because we're not going to be changing anything, we're going to use a const iterator. That's kind of wordy. Uh, we have to put the type name in because it's a dependent name. If you don't, technically, it's going to be a, a syntax error. Um, this is pretty straightforward. Work through all the elements in the container. Then check for whether we find an actual null. And in old C++, zero is really like the most universal way to specify a null pointer. Null will work most of the time. Other things might work, void star, zero, whatever. But that's kind of the convention because it's the most portable. But it doesn't really indicate its use, right? Zero doesn't really imply pointer. You have to know from the, from the context what's going on. So those are just some things in old C++ that are a little bit iffy. We'll get back to the implementation of that. Let's look at the use of it. So here's an example of code that uses that fine null um, function template. And it starts by creating a vector of in pointers and stuffing it. So in old C++, that's kind of what you have to do. Do it one by one, or you can create an array of pointers and then initialize the vector from the array. Either way, it's, it's, it's fine. Then we need a variable to hold the result of find all. So again, we need this um, word declaration here. Now we know we've got a vector of n star, so it's a specific type. We don't need a type name here, right, because it's not in a template. Uh, but we still have to provide this stuff. And the rest of this is pretty conventional. Once we get the result, um, then perhaps we want to know the offset of that null pointer in the original container. So we need a variable to hold that. Well, it just so happens if you subtract a couple of iterators, the uh, formal type that that represents is the vector's difference type. Kind of unintuitive. When I do this, I always forget I put int. It usually doesn't matter. Sometimes it will. So that's the formal way to do it. So let's start by looking at how new C++ would handle that client code. First of all, initializing of the vector, a lot more pleasant. We just use this new brace initialization for containers. And uh, we'll talk about that a little bit more in detail. So now we don't need to do them one by one with pushbacks. We don't need to create a separate array of pointers in order to do the initialization. When we call find all, we don't have to tell exactly what the type is. The compiler just figures it out. And unfortunately, in C++, it's always been true you can't call a function until it's been declared or defined. The compiler always knows what type it returns. There's no reason to redundantly have to say it. Let the compiler figure it out. Auto. Of course, old use of auto from C had it's been deprecated ever since C++ 98. It's now more than deprecated. Right? It's been superseded by this new use of auto. This, well, pretty much we can't uh, do anything with that yet. We'll, we'll, we'll prove this a little bit in a minute. Um, down here again for the difference type, we don't have to remember this thing is a difference type. We just use auto to compile it to do that. So code gets a little shorter, gets a little bit more straightforward, less details to remember, and, um, well, and probably a performance increase from using um, this new type of initialization for the vector. OK, in old C++, let's say you have a function template like product that uh, takes a couple of values of unknown types and multiplies them. What should be declared to return? We don't know. Right? It depends on the types of T and U. There's no way in old C++, at least not with the standard language I'm aware of, of filling this in in a way that's going to be correct. In new C++, there is. So, this is a combination of a slightly different application of the auto keyword. So now, auto doesn't mean figure it out here. Auto really means, I'll tell you later, in this particular case. And a new trailing declaration return type syntax is used. Yes, we've overloaded the arrow operator. Oh, well. Um, standard companies like to reuse syntax. So the arrow following the header line here says, following this is the type of um, what the function returns. And the new decal type keyword can be used to take any uh, expression or type name and evaluate to its type. So we're basically saying the type is whatever you get by multiplying t and u. At this point, the compiler has all the information it needs, knows type of t and type of u, to know what the type of that multiplication result is. And uh, it's free because it's compile time. It doesn't actually use the multiplication, of course. It doesn't have values. It just figures out what the type would be. So now we go back to the uh, find null algorithm, I'm sorry, function template, and uh, apply some of these uh, to it. 
So first, the return type. We we'll use auto and trailing function of return type. So it returns the decal type of whatever the iterator is for this container. See that we get. Um, right, this one isn't necessarily a const iterator. That's okay. It'll still work. And down here where we were testing against zero, actually this is a new feature, null pointer. So instead of putting a zero, which doesn't really provide a whole lot of self-documentation, null pointer is there to say uh, this has to be some sort of null pointer, and uh, it'll compare true against any pointer that's null. Otherwise, um, this isn't a pointer type that wouldn't even compile. So it's a way of catching more potential errors at compile time. And so far, those are the only changes there. Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> You said no questions. We can't ask questions as you go. I'm not going to have time to get through the slides. So if you okay. have questions, you can defer them to the end. Yeah, sorry. Okay. Um, I've been through this. This is the way to do it. Okay. That's why it's a whirlwind introduction. And hopefully I'll actually be able to get to the end of it. C++ 11 provides an alternative to member functions for the, um, specifying the begin and end iterators for a range. Uh, the old member functions still work for containers that support them. But the non-member version of begin and end is more generalized so that it'll work even with non-container types like built-in arrays. Uh, in this example, let's say we have a function uh, that returns true if the length of some string is greater than four. Uh, and here is an initialized vector of some ints, and we want to apply the find algorithm. So the non-member find, instead of saying v.begin, we just say begin v and end v. And that works, and it basically translates to number function calls for a container. For built-in arrays, however, um, do we have one here? Yeah, so here's a, a built-in array of uh, care stars, for example. Um, we can use the same syntax here, and it'll apply with the built-in array. Of course, we could use the member function names up again for uh, a native array. So the non-member form is more general, uh, it can be used in templates. And then those templates can be specialized on containers or native arrays, and um, they'll both work. So a little bit more general. So now we can apply that additional change to find all. And uh, this is about as far as I'm going to go with find all for this time. So turn from use the new form, non member form, and all of this. So another advantage of null pointer is a little more straightforward when you see it um, in code, you know, we're talking about a pointer. It also eliminates an ambiguity. Uh, in old C++, if I overload uh, the F function for long and for care star, as long as you provide the exact types, the compiler's happy. Uh, but if you try to provide a type that can equally convert to one or the other, it's a fatal error. Uh, so yes, you could always static cast zero to a care star or something and, and clarify what you mean. But that's pretty ugly. So a uh, better way is to use just null pointer when you're meaning the null pointer. And this unambiguously match to this version of f. And we'll not have any ambiguity issues with <coughs> overloads of f where there would have been anything else. All right, in the old days, iterating over any type of container, um, Either you can use an algorithm, or if you use a uh, basic loop, uh, you have to set up the loop, initialization, to test, or increment, etc. Whether it's a built-in array or a vector container, and that works. It's an idiom everybody's familiar with. Probably not too hard to understand that code, but errors can creep in. Boundary off by one errors in some of these expressions. Um, and yes, the modern style moved to using algorithms as much as possible for each, for example. But um, for Keeping it simple, you know, people will still tend to just use a simple for loop because it's so ingrained and usually, usually it's not right. An improvement in C++ 11 is the range-based for loop. So it takes care of boundary conditions. You just say for, and then this, we're also using uh, auto here to simplify the type. Uh, for each i in ai, whatever ai is, we'll figure it out. So this will just go through and make i be the appropriate type, in this case int, uh, for every element in that array, and then you can do something with it. If you want to modify it, you, know, you can use a reference type instead, and modify each element when you work through the loop. So for displaying results, uh, even for uh, working through a set of values using um, syntax like this, it's actually a feature I haven't talked about in detail yet, um, range-based for all of these. 
Alright, real simple. You know, C++, you have to put a space there, now you don't. End of story. Just one needs one more. Compile cycle once in a while, right? And the committee doesn't have time to quite come up with the syntax that would make this work. All right, uh, in, actually back in the old C library, there is a uh, macro known as assert, right? The old venerable assert macro. Um, test this condition at runtime. If it's true, do nothing. Essentially, continue. If it's false, create a diagnostic fault program. So in C++11, there is a compile time assert um, now available in the language, and it's called static assert. Uh, we provide a condition, if it's a compile time evaluatable condition, it's legal, and uh, if the condition is false, then you'll get a fatal error at that point with an error message as we specified here. So it allows things to be checked at compile time rather than having to take runtime to do them. It's always better to get errors at compile time than runtime, right? The caveat, of course, is these conditions have to be formed from compile time constant expressions. However, in C++11, the family of compile time constant expressions is greatly uh, enhanced with things like constant expert. One of the features not going to have much time to talk about. An example, uh, if you want to make sure your program is only compiled on 32 machines, just to go into static asserts at the top. Uh, as long as the size of int is at least four, it'll do nothing. Otherwise, it'll give you a fatal error when we compile, and it'll give you the explanation of why. Here's a trick that uh, Steve Dewhurst actually first uh, shared with me, and I love this trick. Let's say you wanted a safe cast, right? Casts, sure, the new style casts are safer than the old style do everything casts, but it's still possible to do things like cast doubles to ints and have the result be completely meaningless. You'd like to avoid those kinds of things. So here's a, a way to do something like that. Um, it's a template safe cast that would take any expression E and cast it to some type R. So a way to use it would be safe cast the int of some expression. And the idea here is that there's any chance that conversion might lose information, that might be impossible, then it would diagnose it at compile time and give you a message. So you'd use this to make sure there's no funny uh, runtime behavior. So safe casting a long to an int right, is going to be OK as long as ints and longs are the same size. And this will compile on a machine where longs are bigger than ints. This would fail at compile time with a possible in safe cast attempt. Um, this would always fail, right? You can never safely, according to this definition of safe, uh, cast a long into a, into a character. This one doesn't do the compiler error. This one uses static so. All right, moving on. In the early days of C++, um, there were, I guess the original way of compiling templates was sort of the way we compile C++ function libraries now. They were actually compiled separately. And then processed um, from, from separate module files. That technique of dealing with templates has kind of been superseded by the inclusion model these days where everything in the kitchen sink is in source code in a header file. When you compile, you see the full implementation of, of a template in source code form. It turns out there's a lot of advantages of that. Um, but there's also some disadvantages, the biggest one being code flow. If you have a large application spread out over 10 or 15 uh, source files, and each of them includes the same headers with the same um, class templates. It's possible the compiler will instantiate those class templates, a lot of those member functions, redundantly in, in all the different modules. Then the linker basically throws all of them away except for one copy of each member function. That's just the way it has worked. It, it works, and that's the way the compiler and linker, linker work together. Um, optimizations have come along to try to fix, you know, address this problem. Uh, Pre-compiled headers, um, other other optimizations, but ultimately there's a lot of work, a lot of additional um, code generation and processing that had to happen. The C++ community tried to address this problem with the export keyword for C++ 98. It turned out export was an interesting idea. It didn't really end up improving performance all that much, um, which the EPG folks found out. So, I got a little ahead of myself here. So the export keyword, um, it, it was implemented and turned out not to really uh, be a benefit. So because of that, EPG actually blessed the committee uh, doing away with the export keyword. And a different approach has been uh, come up with that actually solves this problem very elegantly. And that is to simply tell the compiler that a particular class template 
uh, is going to be instantiated elsewhere. So borrowing the old extern keyword, extern template, and we declare our vector specialization. So when the compiler sees this, it goes ahead and um, instantiates the class definition for the specialization, you know, the, the declarations, but it doesn't actually generate the code for the functions uh, in this module. And it still allows it to do all the checking that's necessary and generate all the code and all the hooks to all the actual functions. And then in just one module of the application somewhere, you explicitly instantiate the template, and then that's the module where the compiler actually goes ahead and generates the number of functions for that template specialization. So it's pretty elegant and solves the problem, uh, and it doesn't require the complexity uh, that the export keyword as defined in the earlier standard did require. Okay, another C old C++ issue is exception specifications. Anybody who knows Java here? Um, in Java, exceptions are very, very elegant. Uh, if a method declares it's going to throw some exceptions, and some other method calling that method doesn't acknowledge that might happen, it's a compiler. So when you call a method, you have to somehow or another acknowledge these exceptions might occur. C++ has never had that requirement. So the whole idea of a, a, a function in C++ declaring, I'm going to throw this in this exception, really doesn't, it, it's not enforced. Uh, it's not something that the compiler, the caller, is even going to particularly care about, and it adds performance cost, uh, because now the function making the declarations actually has to check uh, to see if those exceptions are being thrown or some other type of being thrown and translating into bad exceptions and whatever. So. Um, other issues, templates, for example, if you're going to write a template and it's going to have member functions, how do you know what to put into an exception specification? Right? You don't know the type of T and uh, what sort of exceptions that its member functions call. And it's just a sticky wicket. So it turns out even in C++ 98, uh, the library committee already recognized that specifying exceptions was, was not very useful. And the only type of exception specification that ever used is the empty one. Taking that, you know, awareness into account in, in C++11, the new no except keyword simply says this isn't going to throw an exception. And these can also be conditional. So if inside of the swap or whatever function, um, other functions can be called that might throw exceptions, this can be uh, configured to be conditional on whether those other sub-functions throw exceptions or not. But ultimately it ends up with kind of a binary state whether a particular function throws an exception or not. It turns out it's much easier to generate efficient code with that simple type of exception specification that handles all the important cases that the empty exception uh, specification did in C++ 98. Um, and so that's the way the library is going to be All right, different problem. How do you write a function to find an average of n values? seems pretty simple. Uh, if you're writing in C, you can actually use a variadic function, right, like printf is an example of a variadic function, where you provide the number of things you can average and then their values. You can do that, but you have to, be, you have to correctly specify the count. There's no type checking there, right? You actually can pass in, so you can pass something else. In fact, the only way to really sort of document what types these values are is by the name of the function or a comment. And this is the average of n's. This is the average of doubles. And the first thing is just the count. It's always going to be a size two or whatever. Uh, and then we don't know what, what those types really are, but the function just has to trust that that's what's actually passed. Um, default arguments, that won't work, right? Because you can't query how many arguments were passed when you do default arguments. So you can't calculate an average if you don't know how many things were actually passed. Um, overloading in templates, you can get a little closer there, but then you have to provide lots of overloads. That's pretty ugly. So, C11 provides, not particularly to solve this problem, but I thought it was a simple example for how variadic templates would be useful. Uh, templates that, takes, that take uh, an unspecified number of arguments. So, let's see how we would uh, go about doing an average using this thing. Um, first of all, before we can do an average, we have to be able to get a sum of the values that were being passed. Right, so variadic templates kind of use a, uh, a recursive approach to things where there's a general case and a terminal condition. So the general case is uh, we, add, we ask for a sum 
of an object of type t and then a bunch of other stuff. And what's the sum of all of that? Well, it's the sum of this t object plus the sum of all the other stuff. So variadic template parameters, variadic function arguments, or function parameters, and they're a matched set. And the compiler understands when I say rest, I'm talking about a whole bunch of individual values of types, which were uh, a whole bunch of types inside of that parameter path, so to speak. So that lets us do uh, sum of any arbitrary number of arguments, and it works. But that's part of what we need to do on average. To actually get the average, um, here's the average function. We'll let the compiler figure out what the type is. It's going to be based on the arguments, right? You can actually mix and match different types, and, and it'll work. The parameter backs can handle that. The type of the result is going to be whatever the type of summing the, the, the values is. Then we're just going to divide it by the count. So that type should stay the same. And then to calculate the average, we calculate the sum, using the fun, uh, functions on the previous slide, and just divide it by the number of arguments. Fortunately, the parameter pack mechanism supplies a size of operator specific for parameter packs, which actually just yields an integer of our size t, which the number of parameters that were in that pack, and that will give us the average. So it'll work for a bunch of elements of the same value, it'll even work with elements of different values. So, of course, there's a lot of other uses of variadic jumping parameters, but I think this gives kind of a, a flavor of what, what sort of thing you can use for and how it works. Other basic language features, lots of new types of strings. Originally, there's uh, eight good characters and Y characters, regular strings and Y strings. Now there's different flavors of UTF strings. Little U8 is UTF-8, little U, UTF-16, capital U, UTF-32. Raw strings as well, right? If we wanted to represent this text, uh, right, there's no really clean way to do it in all the C++. Here's one, one way to do it. Uh, try to read that and know what it's trying to say, right? So it'd be nice to use uh, some sort of uh, raw string syntax to be able to say, just make everything literal. And so the syntax is a capital R, a quote, and an open. And now, as long as you don't have text in here that is the sequence, quote, close, you can do anything, and it'll be literal. Um, that's good enough for this example, right? We don't actually need to specify quote, close. So that sequence acts as the closed limiter. If we actually did need to specify quote, close, as part of the string, which in regular expressions is probably real common, then we can we can use a more elaborate syntax here to provide an arbitrary delimiter. We can just make up whatever we want, and then when we supply it at the end, that's the end of the raw string. So it's totally general um, and really simplifies the use of regular expressions and things like this. <coughs> you just have to put together a string with lots of strange characters in there. All right, some other language features. Just want to go through these to mention them at least. The enum class just strengthens the type of enums. They aren't just willy-nilly convertible between ints anymore. Uh, they have a name, uh, you know, a more formal type that um, some types have been provided. Const expert allows more to be done at compile time. You can actually have constant expression functions, for example, where you can specify operations in functional format and it's all handled at compile time, uh, which can be real handy. Long, long, at least 64 bit. Template alias. I was going to do this without an example. I finally decided there's no way to describe it without an example, so I added this last night. But um, this is actually one template. So a template alias is what used to be called template type that It would be nice if we have a template like set to be able to fix one of the types and allow uh, users to specify the template with just specifying the other type. So uh, a set of T where it's always sorting things in descending order could be alias to set greater than. And that would just say set greater than of double, uh, which implies set greater than, uh, it implies set of double and standard order of double. Uh, so that's a mechanism that wasn't available in, in old C++. Um, having co-opted the word using for this, um, why not also just use it to simplify other things? So good old fashioned type defs, while very useful. I mean, imagine what code would look like if there were no type defs at all. It would be awful. But even type defs can be hard to read sometimes. The, the using keyword can be used as an alternate syntax for type defs. 
So uh, this is basically typed up in void func as pointer functions that ignore it and it's returned to void. Uh, nice feature. Align as align up can be used to check the alignment of data types and objects and to force the alignment of data types and objects. Um, these, I'm going to say less about attributes, a way of uh, configuring uh, compiler-specific or platform-specific aspects of code generation. Inline namespaces, the primary use of that for that is for versioning, sort of the way that other managed languages really support versioning elegantly now, the way to do it is in C++. Um, generalized unions and generalized pods. A lot of little details make those a little more powerful. Primarily, now there can be the types of constructors that are in unions and types that are in, that have constructors in pods. Um, they still can't have types with virtual functions and that sort of behavior, but it's a little bit more uh, elaborate than it used to be. There's now an ABI that allows plugging garbage collection into the C++ app in some uniform way. Um, and then user-defined literals. That, that slide on strings earlier really kind of belongs there. but. Um, the whole idea behind user defined literals is you create your own class type and then you create your own custom way of specifying constants. Sort of like integers can have a trailing L or a, training U, a trailing U, right? You can create your own trailing letters that's, but that, that are hardwired for your specific user defined type. So it's a flexible constant type mechanism. And uh, the trick is that you write little functions that do conversions from text to your type and back. So. Um, the rest of this week, there's going to be talks that go into more detail, drill deeper into some of these issues. So, uh, I'm going to just first some slides just to remind you one. Why are lambdas here? We haven't talked about lambdas, so this is in the wrong place. So, we're actually going to talk about lambdas in a minute. You can just sit down that slide. Um, there's another uh, section called, session called Other C11 Gems. I wasn't really sure what was in there, but I think it's likely to be some of the stuff that we've covered in this first section. It's my best guess. Okay, so let's look at class design feature types. Um, issues basically that base classes and derived classes we are using to communicate with each other. First issue. What do you do if you have a class where you don't want to allow clients to copy instances of those objects? There have been a couple of sort of uh, tried and true approaches. Make the copy operations, right, the copy and assignment operators, private. That'll work. Has one draw, a couple of drawbacks. Um, one, you get error messages in different places depending on whether you're the client or whether you're the class implementer. Right? If you're the client, you'll get the compile error. If you're a class implementer, the error won't show up until link time because the compiler will allow you to. Um, use these functions even if they haven't been implemented, then the, the linker will contend they don't exist. So, not exactly perfect. You can in inherit from a class like Boost Non Copyable, has the advantage of being very straightforward and self documenting, has the disadvantage of using inheritance. So, if you need to inherit from another class, now you're into multiple inheritance. Maybe that's an issue, maybe not. You try to avoid that whenever possible. So, up to this point, those were the mechanisms available. In C++11, it's a lot easier. So to, uh, to actually remove the availability of those functions, you use equals delete. Yeah, that's another overloading of another keyword. Uh, but that's so the copy operations here uh, are deleted. And it's very unambiguous. It's always going to yield a compile error, no matter whether you're the client or the implementer of class T. Um, that's really good. But now you can also specify that a particular um, generated function right, uh, just uh, is going to use the default implementation what the compiler would generate if you didn't declare it. And it's important because you know, ordinarily if you just want the generated version, you don't say anything. So I'm just put a comment saying, uh, let the compiler generate it. Someone just has to understand that. This makes it explicit. And so uh, that's an improvement. And so these are Keywords that can be attached to the types of functions that can be generated by the compiler. Uh, they don't mean anything for functions you have to write yourself anyway. Clearly, if you don't declare them, they don't exist if you do them. They're supposed to exist. Right, so now, default construction works fine. Um, direct construction works fine. Copy construction, copy assignment. Well, not compile.
other places where things get dicey and a little bit ambiguous. So here is a base class and some member functions are declared. And then let's say you're looking at the code for a derived class and you're taking a look at this declaration and you want to know, is that virtual? Well, you can't tell from this, right? You have to go back to the base class and see whether it's virtual up there. Um, that's still true in C++11, but there'll be a way to at least specify that you want to make sure that it's virtual. Um, down here, is this an override <coughs> base class function? Well, maybe the person writing this actually thought they were overriding G, but of course they're not, right? Because of the const there. So that's a, a gotcha. So we're just introducing a new virtual function. What about this? Does this override something from the base class? Right? So if you get what overriding means, right, this isn't an override. You can only override a virtual function. You can't override a not virtual. In fact, what's happening here is a design mistake. A non-virtual function just should not be redefined in a derived class under most normal circumstances. So those are all areas of potential ambiguity. And C++11 addresses those with some keywords um, that eliminate that potential ambiguity if everybody does take advantage of it. So first of all, the simple case is an invariant over specialization, a non-virtual function. You can now declare it final. Yeah, borrowed from Java. I'm proud of the standard committee for actually using a word that that's straightforward here. Thank you. So now if you try to redefine it, right? It's never override. You try to redefine it in compile error, good thing. Now you can also specify a derived class. Yes, I really mean for this to override a base class function, and the compiler will enforce that and make sure that it's true. So if there wasn't a virtual f in the base class with this exact signature, this would not compile. If there wasn't a virtual base class g with this signature, this wouldn't compile. So this would now draw an error because it's not overriding g over here, right? Well, this would compile that would be the test. It still takes, you know, remembering to put final when it's going to be final, remembering to put override when you're intending to do that. And if everybody follows those rules, all of a sudden everything becomes a lot more uh, self-documenting, a lot less ambiguous in the class relationships. Again, if you use Java, you're kind of spoiled by Java constructors being able to call each other, right? And in C++, you can't do that. You have to write helper functions and that sort of thing um, that every constructor calls. So this is the kind of hoops you have to jump through. Uh, in old C++, you end up with a lot of redundancy. So each of these flux capacitor constructors needs to make sure that uh, non-static data numbers like ID are properly initialized, capacity is properly initialized. So you get re repetition of the same initializers, the same um, function calls like to validate. And yes, it can be made to work correctly, but now you introduce a potential error there, right? Because one of those is wrong. So in C++11, in acts like Java, a constructor is allowed to invoke another constructor to do um, part of the work. Uh, so in this case, the validate function is being called directly from this constructor down here, the one that takes a complex. And then the other ones don't have to worry about it, just have to make sure that this constructor ends up being called. Uh, a default constructor would initialize itself by invoking this function, and this constructor would initialize itself by invoking the next more complex one. The copy constructor, it has to uh, replicate data directly, right? and it has nothing else to do, so that works fine as well. So we really reduce the amount of, of syntax required here. Um, some would say this, this is a little bit trickier because you have to kind of follow the chain, but ultimately it means you're, you're not replicating code, and that's, that's difficult. Delegating constructors. Another nice thing that it would have been able, it would have been nice to do in, in old C++ is to provide initial values for things in the class definition. But in C++ 98, there's really a limited number of things you can initialize in the class definition. It's basically static, const, integral types, um, and 
as far as I know, uh, the reason this was especially allowed is so that you can use these values as a ring dimension is found here, and that's that's legal. Uh, otherwise, they just you know you can use enums, I guess. Uh, but um, for all other purposes, they, they figure there's other ways to do it. Normally. So it has to be static, I can't remember. It has to be const, and it has to be some integral type, size t, in mod, care, whatever. And then you can initialize it in your class in old C. So in C11, that's been greatly relaxed, and now there's a bunch of things we can do in, in class rather than um, in the constructor. So first of all, a non const static uh, data object can be initialized in C++11. Even, um, even non-static bit can be initialized. And this initialization would be the default, and then the constructors can override that default by providing a different initial value. But if the constructor fails to mention capacity, then each uh, flux capacity's capacity is simply 100 by default. Uh, we can still do the static cost integrals like before, for things like fixed sized arrays. But now you've got all these other data types that can be initialized without the constructor having to think about it. The term user defined conversion, right? What are the user defined conversions? Constructors that take single values are user-defined conversions, and in C++ 98, it can be implicit or explicit. By declaring a constructor that works with one argument explicit, it won't ever be called unless you explicitly ask for it. But there's another type of user-defined conversion, operator functions, operator long. In C++ 98 and old C++, it's a implicit conversion from a class type to long. There was no way to specify that it's explicit. Now there is. So, uh, Right. You can still have the non-explicit conversion operator, so uh, any place in your code where you use a rational and the code calls for a double, uh, this will provide the conversion. You can make it explicit, say if you static cast or some type of explicit uh, syntax to indicate you want to do the conversion. Or, arguably, it's best to avoid those altogether and just have Java like two double functions. Um, personally, I think this is probably the best way to go. But, Explicit is better than implicit conversion operators. In old C++, I would just pass you and never use conversion operators at all. That's absolutely, absolutely necessary. Right, for more on some of these class tools, Scott's session Wednesday at 4.30. All right, moving on. Larger language features. Initialization, lambdas, and move semantics. All right, so in old C++, brace initialization was available, but for kind of a limited um, set of types, right? You can initialize uh, an aggregate like an array with its, a built-in array with its values. You can initialize uh, a struct, uh, basically the class of public values, using brace initialization. And that's really about it. If you try to initialize a vector, you get an error in old C++. Um, you were forced to initialize containers with ranges from other containers or built-in arrays. Um, and that's basically it. So that's been addressed in 11 with the initializer list mechanism. And a pair of braces, uh, in any context other than the ones that were valid for C++ 98, represent a new kind of object called an initializer list. And they're generalized to be used in all sorts of, of situations. So the syntax you know, most people would have tried to use with a vector now actually works. And the more, uh, I think the, the more accepted syntax is actually not to bother using the equal sign for this type of initialization. Um, these can both, I believe, do the same thing as conversation. For an, the term initializer is a little bit misleading because, yes, it's great for initializing containers, but it's not used just in the case of initialization. In this case, we're actually replacing the contents of the vector, we're assigning to it, and we can use an initializer list. So you can think of that as initializing an anonymous 
initializer list object and then um, assigning to the vector from that initializer list object. So this code down here is kind of a peek behind the scenes in how the containers would be implemented. It'd be a constructor that takes an initializer list, an assignment operator that takes an initializer list, and so forth. So by writing this, you're actually ending up using this function down here uh, to perform the assignment. So it, it always initializes something, but it's not necessarily initializing the named object that we were working with. Okay, initialize the vector here using the syntax. Um, use an, anon uh, an anonymous initializer list as uh, parameters for an algorithm. So yes, this requires an overload of the insert a member function for vectors that takes an iterator and an initializer list. So again, we're not initializing the vector here, we're initializing the list of values that are being inserted into the vector. If you put them into a range phase four, um, you can return an initializer list and how it figures out that's being used to initialize this vector event. Down here, we call that function and use those values in this range phase four. If you're kind of concerned that it's expensive to return a vector, don't worry, I have a solution for that coming up shortly. All right, sticking with uh, initialization. So we talked about aggregate initialization there, but even individual objects being initialized, in old C++ there was a lot of room for improvement. So let's go through this old C++ example and see how we can get into trouble. Uh, first line here, uh, this one's fine. We're initializing uh, dynamically allocated int to 10. Uh, with no parentheses there, okay, it means uninitialized. Great, right? you just have to know that. If you want it default initialized, put an empty set of parens. Now we default initialized an int, which we're going to be equal to zero. Great. What about non-dynamic? Here's a, an automatic object, v1, being initialized to 10. Fine. What if you want it default initialized? Leave out the initializer? Not quite, right? This is a classic C++ syntax problem. The compiler looks at this and says, uh -uh, it's not initialization, it's a declaration of a function. There's no arguments returning yet. Kind of a major beginner pothole there. Or an advanced user pothole. Kind of beginning no matter what. What about this? What is that? Unless you know what var is, you don't know what that is. You don't know if that's an object being initialized or a function being declared. Because var might be a type. You don't know. You've got to go somewhere and figure out what var is. No, Other issues. Initializing I to 5.5. Perfectly legal. Right? And of course, the truncates. Why do we want to do that? Who knows? But the language makes it legal. Here's a double with some ridiculously large value in initializing it from that. Again, perfectly legal in C++ and old C++. I and in new C++ if you use the syntax. It's just grandfathered in. Ugly and legal. So, uniform initialization is an attempt to address all these issues with a way of doing initialization that just lets these issues be detected in compile time and diagnosed. So, redoing all those examples, um, we can dynamically allocate an int and initialize the 10. Okay, that looks pretty much the same way as the parentheses. Uh, we can initialize the local variable to 10. Works pretty much the same way. With no, uh, no braces or friends at all, it's still an uninitialized thing. It has to be backwards compatible with the old behavior. But now it's a named local variable. The empty braces imply default construction, whatever construction means for him. Okay, there's no ambiguity here. This is not a function declaration. Only an object. That's great. Uh, now we have var up here, actually declared with type def. So we can tell this is a function declaration. Uh, if what we actually intended was you know, to um, initialize an object named foo with the value of var, thinking var was a value, this, this would be a, a sign of failure until you tried to use foo later. But now we would just use braces to mean we're, mean we're initializing. The compiler would immediately diagnose that as a legal because it knows you can initialize foo to the value of var using braces. So if we just switch to using braces for all initialization, we're getting a lot more errors diagnosed with compile time. All of them, actually. Um, truncation, as well, is not for me um, for brace initialization. So, initializing j to x here would be an error. 
uh, initializing i to 5.5 would be an error. Uh, I mean, who would really want to do that? Let's talk about functions and function pointers. So here's a function is pi. So I return true if some value is greater than n. And here's a vector we initialize with some values. And we want to apply the find it value. We find the first element in the vector that is positive. So it's perfectly legal. But by passing the name of a function, we're passing a function pointer. Function pointers tend not to be inlined. Um, compilers just, if they see you using a function pointer, they figure um, this is not going to be inline. It's going to be a, an actual function pointer, and it's going to be relatively inefficient to apply that test in Java. One way of solving that problem is to apply the old function adapters, right? Um, we don't have to create a new function that way. We don't need this pause. We just use the built-in function object greater. And uh, we find second argument zero. This gives us the performance that we're looking for. But it's not exactly intuitive, right? That, that syntax is a little bit tough to deal with. So yeah, we can get the performance, but it's kind of a six one half goes by the other way, or lesser of two evils, whether it's the performance or the uh, syntax that we want to optimize. Function objects give us uh, another solution. We can provide an is pause uh, function object class, instantiate one of these, and then use that anonymous function object. That's efficient because the compiler understands the type of this and it will apply inline um, to give us this functionality inside of the uh, generated algorithm there. However, it still separates the logic from its use. So you have to go back and look up what's the logic up here when you use it down here. So it's still not optimal. And so this is just kind of the history of uh, applying function behavior <coughs> to an algorithm. And in C++11, uh, lambda expressions have been introduced. And what lambdas do is allow you to just put the logic you're interested in right at the place where you can use it. And the syntax, at first, it looks a little bit strange, but you get used to it really fast. And the fact that it's a local um, specification of behavior right where you want to know what it's going to do really trumps the fact that it's a little bit strange in the syntax. So the pair, the pair of square brackets introduce a lambda. Uh, in this case, it's an anonymous function object being created. So it kind of creates the same code as this uh, ispos named function object did, uh, but we don't have to give it a name. And then that anonymous, anonymous function object is invoked in the specialization of the algorithm and the inline you can apply because all the code is available to compile there. Yeah. That's the lambda expression. In that example, the lambda didn't use any data that was in the context of the calling code, but they can. So this is a little bit more elaborate of an example. I kind of stole this example from one of Scott Meyer's examples of function objects that determine whether a particular value is equal to some target plus minus epsilon. So if we want to go through this container and find every value that's uh, 4.9 plus or minus 0.3, right, uh, we would have, uh, so we could write a function object to do that, or we could write a lambda expression that actually uh, captures the value of target and epsilon, right, because these aren't parameters to the function, these are just local variables out here in the surrounding context. But because this is actually creating a function object with its own local data, we have to tell it we're going to be using these values from the surrounding context. And some internal mechanism has to actually make reference to these things out here from inside the function object. And this is how to do it. So in this case, we're actually capturing these by value. And then what the partition algorithm is going to do is apply each value in here um, predicate uh, is going to be applied to that value, and it's going to return true if it's plus or minus, if it's target plus or minus, so. so down here we apply a for each to display all the values that actually satisfy that predicate that we're going to be the container. OK, so next problem, I alluded to this earlier, excessive copying. Um, one of the problems with old C++ is the way the language is defined, unless you have very, very smart optimization, 
you can end up with copies being made and they really weren't needed. Sometimes all you really want to do is take a piece of data and just move it from one place to another without having to make a copy. There was no way to generalize that idea of moving objects in the old C++. So all kinds of stopgap effort has been made over the years um, to optimize that. Uh, the return value optimization. Uh, so the actual value being returned isn't actually copied, but the address of it is passed into the function, and the function constructs it in place and just returns nothing, and the return value is provided. Um, example, let's say we have a big data type. So it's expensive to copy, presumably it has some dynamic aspects, large binary object, whatever, it's a string type of class. It's expensive to copy. So the, the language rules say when you write a function that returns one of these things by value, it implies a copy. Of course, compilers can optimize that to behave as if a copy is made. That's how the RVO um, was born. But technically, um, you, have to, you have to think in terms of the copy being made in the worst case. So even though we're just returning an anonymous temporary object, there's one local object that's technically created and destroyed. There's the return value that's technically created and then destroyed. So there could be up to three of these objects that are created, and eventually the third one's destroyed, when all you really want to do is one. That's the kind of description of the problem. Binary operators, like operator plus. Yes, you can write in the take by reference. That's good. That's the right way to do it. But you can't really fix the return by value part. There's no good alternative to return by value. My slide will show some of the people who try. Anyway, when you call in old C++ a function like make big, it could be up to three constructors and two destructors involved. Again, depending on what sort of optimization uh, that can be reduced. But technically, a student compiler will do three constructions, two destructions before it moves on from here. Um, performing addition. Again, at least one extra copy is probably going to be created in most environments. It's not really necessary. Okay. So, you could try to address the problem um, by changing what these functions return. Like operator plus could return a reference, a raw pointer. Um, these are just ugly solutions. There's no way to make them work. You could return a smart pointer. That's better because performance hits involved, especially if you use something like shared pointer. You don't really want multiple objects shared and the coordination of those objects with the reference counts. You just want a single object to return. The key, the C11 solution is if we know that a returned object is a temporary, we know that it's never going to be needed after it's done being used in this particular context. In this particular context. So if we can somehow formalize that something is temporary, it's never going to be needed again, then we can work with it. And the solution is a new type of reference called the R value reference in C11. It's declared with two ampersands. So type ref ref. Most people talk about it. So let's compare the two. Old L value reference, the original type of reference, binds to named objects. R value reference only binds to unnamed temporaries. So something like 10 is an unnamed temporary. If you try to bind an R value reference to a named object, it will not compile. The whole idea is we want to just unambiguously know if we're referring to something with one of these R value references, we won't need it later. We, we have it now. We won't need it anymore after we're done with it. So we can't possibly bind it to something like I, which we know is going to be around. Compile the text that it's there. We can take the result of an expression and represent it with an R value reference, right? This is a temporary expression that doesn't have a name. It's perfect can to be re referred to an R value reference. If we take uh, a function like fn, which returns uh, an R value, right? we're not allowed to refer to that with a L value reference. Okay, we can put const here. That's okay. All right, but now we're not allowed to do anything to RI3. So um, there's a price to pay for that. Um, finally, we can take function returns and R value temporary, and we can find that uh, find an R value reference to it. So this kind of shows what you can and can't do with both L values and R value references. And the key is the things you can do with an R value reference facilitate the optimization of, um, of copying. So we all know, or we have probably heard, 
that there's this concept of move of copy operations, right? The copy constructor and the copy assignment operator together are kind of considered a matched set in old C++. And typically they're, they're treated together. You either allow them both or you don't. There's exceptions, but usually they're, they're treated together. And these, this is how they're declared. So they take references to the const t. L value references, meaning these objects will probably continue to exist after they're being uh, operated upon, right? In C++11, there's a parallel universe here, move operations. So in addition to the copy constructor and the copy assignment, we have a move constructor and a move assignment operator. And by saying we have, I say we can have. So any class can have these functions. Um, if you don't declare them, in certain circumstances, the compiler will generate them for you. In those cases, the behavior will be trivial. When you want to use these is when there's some advantage to actually using them. So for pod types, data with you know, an int and a double, you wouldn't bother writing these move constructors because there's no advantage to moving uh, pod types over copying them. But if you have types with lots of dynamic data, moving can be a major optimization because you don't have to do the deep copy. And in those cases, you wouldn't provide these. Notice that their reference, our, our, our value <coughs> reference to non-cost. And that implies the objects that are going to be changed. Part of the trick of moving is that when you move, you're transferring the resource from the source to the destination. And you're leaving the source sort of as an empty husk. So it still has to exist because at some point that object is going to be destroyed. But it shouldn't have any more dynamic resources associated with it. Those resources were moved out of it. That was the whole point of having the move operation in the first place, whether it's construction or, or assignment. So because of that, you can't have reference to cost. That would imply you can't modify it. And, and that's the underlying mechanism for um, move operations. So let's go back and say we have a class that's big and resource intensive. It points to some big blob. And we go ahead and we give it a move constructor and move assignment operator. So the, the original copy operations still do what they did. They do a deep copy. The move operations would transfer um, the pointer BPP from the source to the destination. Then they would typically null out the pointer in the, de in the source object um, or otherwise indicate to it that you know, the destructor has nothing to do. If it's a raw pointer, you set it to zero, the destructor will be safe. And that's the general idea. Given that optimization, now if we have operations like uh, addition or um, performing some operation on an object and returning a new version of it, uh, or just being a factory function, basically, right? In old C++, factory functions typically didn't return values, they returned pointers. It's the only way to get them to be efficient. Factory functions will now be able to actually return values, which is more intuitive, and the move operations will make those returns very, very efficient. So let's see what happens here. Uh, we have a couple of bigs named x and y, another one named a. So a equals make big. One big created. In old C++, if this is returned by a value, technically there would be at least two, maybe three objects involved. Here, the actual big is created here in the function. In this, this anonymous object, that is an you know, anonymous construction of a big object. And that's my one big. Then when it's returned, it'll be moved. I have to admit, there's a semantic verbal challenge to describing this because technically there's more than one object involved. So there's actually this anonymous temporary in here, which doesn't have a name. Then there's the return expression, which is another technically anonymous object. And then there's um, A itself, right? Which actually existed here, and it's a third object. So, there's really three separate objects involved, but the guts were only created once, and then they were transferred around. So that's what I mean by one big actually created. All right, the contents were constructed once, and then just transferred around efficiently. Some people don't like the syntax that there's one object created. The, the comment, you know, I've had little debates about this, but that's the spirit of it. There's one actual expense of construction. Um, 
initialize b from the sum of x and y. The one b that's actually created is one that's created inside of operator plus. Then it's move constructed back to the, to the context of this construction. And then that's used to move construct b. Um, here as well, this is the object created in the, op in the operator plus, and then it's just move sign on top of that in the old value of h root. Um, now in this case, you probably can avoid the fact that these two objects created because there's the object created in operator plus, and then there's also the object created which is the return type of the module. So uh, sometimes you still end up with uh, several objects, but you can, you can always fix that. Um, for move enabled types like big, swapping them, no object created whatsoever. In sequence plus 11 only. And we're going to take a look at that in a little more detail. And to me, that's kind of the heart of the benefit of move semantics is when we look at the behavior of swap between um, sequence plus 98 and sequence plus 11. So here's the old swap from, from old C. Um, and the swap signature is going to be the same. I mean, we have to maintain source compatibility. So the old way to swap is you make a temporary to copy one of the objects. You assign um, the other object to the first object, and then you assign the temporary back over. This is three copy operations. There's no way around that. If you try to invoke this swap, even on a move-enabled object like the big, you'll still get three copies. And a type being move-enabled does not make it somehow magically immune to copying when the code that's copying it can only do copies. What we'd like is for swap to work more efficiently for types that have been moved. This is the C++11 implementation of swap. Notice the signature is still the same. Again, it has to be. It's the same interface. So clients will still be calling what they think is the same swap they used to be copying. But under the covers, the implementation now says, if possible, move. And what that really does is it takes whatever type this thing is and turns it into an R value reference rather than an L value reference. As an R value reference, if the move constructor is available, is, is implemented, it will be used. And that will become an efficient move. And if it's not, it will revert to the old copy operation. But for all types now that are move enabled, the use swap will be very, very sweet and efficient. It's a tricky mechanism. It takes probably several times of going through it, thinking about it, seeing lots of examples. I've probably seen two or three conference presentations on R value references and move semantics before I grokked it. So hopefully that, that was enough to, to get you started in the process. The process of uh, and okay, so here's where this really belongs. I guess I have a question. So um, Michael's session on lambdas, like you said, you talked about lambdas in this session. All right, we're getting there. Not too bad. So we've covered the language uh, for the most part. Let's move to, well, we'll move to the library next. Let's go over some of the new features of the library. And being a loose conference, these are the ones most of you are probably the most familiar with already, since they all pretty much came from loose. So function objects, right? If you write a function template that's generalized, there's a certain number of different kinds of things that the type cred can be. It could be a function pointer, it could be an uh, anonymous or named function object. But that generality only applies when it's a template. Right? Once it's been specialized, it has a specific type. So what we would like to have is some way to extend this kind of generality where a single object can represent things that are different, but that have the same behavior. So that have either the same signature or a close enough signature in a way that they can be passed around and manipulated, and not just as template parameters. So that's where standard function comes in. Now here's an ordinary function, string length, that happens to return a size t. I want to represent it by something that acts kind of like a function pointer, but isn't a function pointer, because function pointers have the drawback of not being optimized very well when you use them with algorithms. You'd like to avoid them. You want to use function objects or something that's more optimized. Function so it's really more about representing it independent of its actual type or its signature. It can be just a close enough signature. So a function 
that act, a function object fn acts like a function that takes a reference to a constant and returns it. And it can be used to represent this string length function, even though the signature isn't exactly the same, right? This says int, this says size t, close enough to government work. It will accept that, it will work. It can be a member function, because I have to deal with that. Call, um, call it then passing a string. It knows how to take a parameter, turn it turns into uh, an implicit object or a member function. It can be a lambda. Right, so here's a lambda that uh, takes a reference to a string and returns uh, whatever length it turns. You can represent that as well. So function objects have a general function holder. Um, they can hold anything that is a function pointer, a function object um, with signatures that both parameters and return types are compatible. And that's useful. In old C++, you find yourself either having to write these little special purpose functions or having to write function objects to do these kinds of operations. Here's a function greater than five, or it returns true if something's greater than five. And we can apply that to an algorithm, but being a function pointer, that's not going to be very efficient. Uh, so the, the efficient approach is to use the old function objects and binders together to give us uh, something that can be inline and give us better performance. But bind first and bind second were kind of limited because they each only work with one parameter and um, not multiple parameters. And it requires that the things that you're binding are adaptable, so they have to inherit from you know, standard binary function, standard binary function. Um, all of that was kind of fun. So C++ 11 provides kind of a, a combined functionality for all these things into one fell swoop called standard bind. And standard bind, it's a periodic function, so it actually can work with you know, unlimited number of parameters, and it uses these little placeholders to indicate um, where particular parameters to the function object that's created are mapped into uh, parameters to some other um, functionally callable object. So in this particular case, greater int, which is a binary function object, right? It takes two parameters, true if the first is greater than the second. Um, taking the first parameter to, um, to the function object bind return. So bind will return a function object that takes a parameter. That parameter will end up being passed as the first parameter to greater n. Five will be hardwired as the second parameter to greater n. So we're basically saying for every x, check if x is greater than five. And bind gives us a way to do that. It doesn't require those base classes, unary, binary, function, and all. Um, and it's general, so we don't need to remember bind first, bind second. We just have to remember this syntax, which at first is a little bit clunky, but maybe you can as well. Um, some people just prefer to use lambdas. You get the same benefit, the same performance, um, and the lambdas can be a little bit more straightforward. Uh, given the complexity of, of the kind of function you're binding, one of, these, one of these will probably come out as being more self-documenting than the other. Probably one of the biggest issues in um, trying to educate folks on how to write well-behaved C++ code is how to avoid corruption, memory leaks, and that sort of thing. So one of the classic problems in C and C++ is leaks due to uh, errors, bad maintenance, or in the case of C++ exceptions that occur when there's resources being contained by a raw pointer. So this kind of shows uh, basic problem. If you use a raw pointer to represent data that you've allocated dynamically or otherwise, if inside of some code here uh, somebody you know, maintains this and, and introduces a return statement uh, prematurely or an exception occurs, the code that actually releases those resources is never going to be executed. So the Boost community recognized this problem ages ago and introduced these, um, these facilities which the standard committee pretty much um, adopted uh, as they were originally designed to avoid this problem. And the solution generically is smart pointers. So a smart pointer is an object that, when it's initialized, takes hold of some resource and owns that resource and is responsible for its release. 
uh, because it's an object rather than a raw pointer, then any time a piece of code is exited, uh, the constructor for that object is guaranteed to run. The, the destructor for that object is guaranteed to run it to make sure that the underlying resource is released. So um, a smart pointer is a specific type of resource sure. managing object that also happens to act like a pointer. You use pointer syntax on it, the reference operator, the arrow operator, and things like that. C++ 98 did supply one smart pointer, auto pointer, um, and at the time it, uh, it did solve this problem. Um, it was better than nothing. So you can have an auto pointer to int, and uh, that represents that object. If, uh, an exception occurs somewhere down here, you would destroy that int by the to it and release the resources. So that was fine, but there were some problems for, for the auto pointer. Um, for one thing, if you forget that it only works with single types and you try to use it with arrays, you get undefined behavior. So auto pointers were too stupid to recognize the fact that you're dealing with an array here. And actually, the language is too stupid too, right? Because I mean, whether you do a single int or an array event, the type is in star. You can't possibly know the type of delete that has to be applied and it will use the wrong one in the case of an array. Um, plus, auto pointers have strange semantics, right? When you copy an auto pointer, you're actually transferring the resource. Um, the idea was good, but now that's been provided in the form of objects that use move semantics in C11. We'll see new pointer in a minute. You don't really need auto pointer anymore. So auto pointer has been deprecated. Uh, don't use it in favor of the new smart pointer. So new pointer is pretty much the complete replacement for auto pointer with additional benefits. Take a look at some code. Here's a function that returns a raw pointer. Yeah, it's still going to be there. You're going to have some legacy code for functions that return raw pointers, and we'll deal with them. But the modern style is going to be the right functions that return these uh, new, new style smart pointers directly. So this would be more modern. All right, a unique pointer widget initialized from a raw pointer. So you know, if, if you're stuck with getting your resource from a raw pointer, at least you're you're getting it immediately associated with a, with a smart pointer. So this is the RAI IDM, resource acquisition, business initialization, right? Now, no matter what happens, the unique pointer um, will manage that, that resource. You can copy a unique pointer from uh, another unique pointer. So this one is just being default constructed, so it doesn't actually want a resource yet. Then we can copy it from another unique pointer. If that unique pointer is an R value, so notice that with get widget 2, we're returning the unique pointer by value. Move semantics can be applied to that. And this will move that resource from the temporary that comes back from get widget 2 into wp 2 That's fine. That's what they're designed to do. If you just try to copy one unique pointer to another, it won't compile. Because you're now copying from a named object. It can't be an R value reference. It can't be. So unique pointers are used to represent single objects that aren't going to be shared or reference counted. Performance-wise, if you don't use a custom deleter, which we'll introduce down here, you get the same performance as a raw pointer or an auto pointer, which was also highly optimized. And you don't have this problem of strange, unpredictable behavior when you copy them, if people don't understand what the copy semantics for auto pointer. They can't get into trouble with the compiler. So that's the basic idea of the unique pointer. Um, some benefits, if you, uh, you, can, you can now actually represent arrays as well as single objects. You just have to declare it correctly. And um, I wasn't sure if you could get it wrong if it would still compile, and I found out you do in fact get a nice compiler if you don't match these types. So that's a good thing. Uh, of course, what happens here when it goes out of scope, it goes to apply the correct delete operator, array delete uh, to that point. And here it is. Shared pointer introduced the idea of a custom deleter, and the unique pointer also um, supports that. And the nice, the nice thing here is that it doesn't work just with raw pointers that have to be deleted. Um, unique pointers can hold any resource for which there is a releasing function available. File stars are not object oriented, right? They're just raw pointers. Um, so if you specify when you declare your unique pointer that it holds file pointers, you can also specify that one one of these goes out of scope, the way you release it is you pass it um, to a function that has the signature, which would basically be a closed function in this case. 
And then we instantiate um, this file pointer and provide fclose as the releaser. We'll go ahead and apply fclose instead of delete. Um, the, the performance cost for this seems to vary across platforms. So um, in some platforms, it's actually free, and in some, there's an extra pointer involved, and quite got much good in my mind. So as long as you don't use the custom deleter, uh, it's guaranteed the new pointer is optimal addition. If you use the custom deleter, you might be paying for that. But presumably, if you need the custom deleter, you probably not worry about an extra word of overhead um, to store the, the deleter itself as part of the object. Shared pointer, um, which we'll talk about in a minute, also supports custom deleters. And with shared pointer, there's already a certain amount of overhead, so the custom deleter doesn't really add anything significant. Unique pointer is that issue. You might be paying twice the cost of storage for unique pointer and the custom deleter. So moving on to shared pointer. Unique pointers, single object only, non-share. Shared pointer designed for reference counting. Um, so it's basically non-intrusive reference counting. It's part of the design of the shared pointer. Uh, allows you to take objects and copy their shared pointers around and keep track of how many shared pointers were created. Um, my favorite analogy is it's like links on a Unix file system. You know how the hard link work, hard link mechanism works on Unix? Uh, you can keep making links to files, but there's only one file. The last one's deleted, the file's released. And that's how shared pointers work. So here's a shared pointer to widget. And here's what our widget looks like. And um, the simplest way to create one, or at least the easiest one to explain, is we just use new or raw new expression, which creates a raw pointer widget to be associated with the shared pointer. That works. Uh, now that we have one of these shared pointer widgets, we can uh, copy them into different containers. And then we've got three different sh uh, shared pointer objects now lying around. SPW itself, uh, a copy of it that was pushed into the vector, a copy that was pushed into the list. And then as everything goes out of scope, the, the shared pointers are destroyed, the reference count is reduced by one each time, and finally, uh, the last one is going to be destroyed as SPW. And when the reference count goes to zero, it doesn't really go to zero. When logically it goes to zero, um, the object will be destroyed. So in that last example, we use the new uh, to create the widget. There's an inefficiency in that. And the inefficiency is that, if you go back to this statement, there's a new expression that's evaluated, and this object is constructed. Then there's the construction of a shared pointer. And the shared pointer itself allocates some dynamic resources, like for the reference count. So now there's at least two separate dynamic allocations that have to happen. Now you might think, well, OK, but you're getting something for that. Yeah. But if we can avoid the redundant allocations, wouldn't that be even better? So that's the trick behind. Um, the variadic version of <coughs> creating a shared pointer, make share. So with make share, we supply a um, parameter list. And what the compiler does is it realizes these are the parameters that are to be passed to the widget constructor. And it just goes ahead and while it's um, creating the shared pointer, it creates the object, the widget itself, and the reference count sort of in the same commonly allocated block of memory. So you end up just with less memory allocation involved. So generally speaking, you use make share if you can. And if you can't because you're required to use some legacy library to get your pointer to widgets, you do that. But when you can do it like this, and, and let the compiler um, generate the policy and instruct the widget yourself, you are better off doing that. So that's the make share sort of. And there's no making the information. Uh, that may be changed later on. All right, more library, uh, the array template. Since I'm running a little bit short of time here, um, I'm going to, I think, skip array. I don't know what it is. Array are basically um, templatized primitive arrays, right? So, so hash based containers. Again, how many of you are unfamiliar with hash based containers? I do want to talk about library performance improvements in general. So we've talked about things like move semantics. Um, containers will generally cross the board benefit from those move operations. You don't necessarily have to think about it. If you uh, put objects that have move enable functionality into containers, internally containers will take advantage of that. Um, 
Member functions like pushback uh, are overloaded to work with R value references. And then um, there's new functions like in place back where you, just like for make share, you provide the constructor parameters. You in place back, you just provide the constructor parameters. The actual construction takes place inside of the function rather than passing the pointer. Uh, sequence containers, vector, the internal reallocation is going to be much more efficient if you move some activities. Imagine a vector reaches capacity and has to grow. In 98, it copies all those elements across in 11 if you move them. Um, so that's tricky. Uh, some of the performance issues are only being still, still being sort of worked out in the scope. But generally, it's, it's much better. Sorting, right? Clearly, if you're going to be swapping elements all over the place, well, sorting is more efficient if you move them than if you have to make copies. Uh, and then things like initializer lists and lambda streamlines, streamline use of algorithms rather than more efficient. Here's some of the stuff we didn't have time to cover. <laughs> Sorry, I want to get to uh, threads, and that's kind of important. So, kind of taking stock on what's been covered in uh, C 98 versus 11. Some things that C 98 just totally ignored GUIs, garbage collection, um, different ways of doing exception handling and multi thread. So, none of this stuff was even mentioned in the old standard. In C 11, we still don't have GUIs, we still don't have binary blocks. We don't really need them. Garbage collection, as we mentioned, there is an, an interface that's kind of specified so you can plug in garbage collection. Multi-threading is the big one. Uh, so there is now a uh, much more formal, or well, a formal support for multi-threading in C++. So let's talk about that. And notice it's not really part of the language, it's not really part of the library, but it crosses into both realms and is separate from all of them. And it's just a whole new aspect. So I want to talk about some real basic thread stuff. There's going to be some other sessions that look in much more detail. Multi-threading is complicated. If you ever look up some of the tutorials that are out there, uh, there are multiple parts and they're not even finished yet. Language and library support are both important. Um, it's a matter of really learning best practices more than just syntax. In that way, it's a lot like exception handling, where you know, the basic syntax get you so far. Then you have to learn how to actually write exception save code. And it involves things that the standard doesn't even really talk about. Levels of exception safety. Um, read a good book. Williams has a good book on concurrency. All we can do here is just scratch, scratch the surface. So what's a thread, right? In C++ 98, main is the beginning of a thread of execution, and that's all there is officially support one single thread of execution. In 11, additional concurrent threads can be started by instantiating a thread object. So if you've got a multi-core system, they can truly be concurrent. If you've got a single core system, it's time sharing. Both, both scenarios are coded essentially the same way. I mean, the system internally takes advantage of whatever course and other hardware is available. So in the very easiest possible manner, here is a two-thread program. It turns out this program doesn't work. But it at least shows the separation of a thread. So here, this instantiates a thread T0 based on this functionality of hello. Um, once this statement's been executed, this thread is presumably executing. This one continues to execute. What happens here though is main finishes. And when main finishes, if this thing is still active, uh, the library in the runtime doesn't like that. So this is not a very good way to code threads. It's kind of an indeterminate on the behavior situation. Better to wait for your other thread to actually finish. So you launch the thread here, it starts running. Um, we do something, now we can wait for that thread to complete. All right, so presumably we'll see both these messages uh, at this point, and then we will continue to, uh, to execute and just terminate. So in this case, you won't get a funky runtime message saying um, something wrong with the thread. So those, those examples just use a simple function, but uh, threads can be started based on any callable object. So it can be a simple function, it can be a function object, right, an instance of hello that can be invoked as a function. Here's the animal operator. Um, or it can be a lambda. Here's an example of that here again. So uh, named function object, or named, yeah, named function object can be a thread, and an anonymous function object can be a thread. Braces here. If you don't do that, you end up with a C++ most vexing parse scenario. That's exercise for the scenario. A lambda can be launched as a thread as well. Let's be 
formal derivative for the models of the So those are some very sort of launching threads. What about the threads have, or the functions that run in the threads have parameters? So here's a function rho that takes a couple of parameters. Now here's a function object, capital H rho that takes a single parameter. One way to make this work, use bind. So for the case of the uh, function pointer, we associate these two parameters with that function and then start that thread. In the case of the function object, the um, main instance below bound with one parameter or the anonymous instance below bound with one parameter. All of these work. Okay? And then these thread runs to work with each other. The better way to do it, though, is you have to take advantage of the variadic uh, mechanism in C11. So here's our, uh, we'll use the same functions and function objects from the previous slide. Instantiate thread T1 with the function below with the following parameters. So no bind required. And what's happening here under the covers is it's a periodic function. It figures out there's two parameters and it passes those to below using forward intuition or text probably. Replicated and involved in both the function and in that thread. So here's a name function object, and again we use the periodic thread constructor or a anonymous function object using the periodic constructor. So a little bit more elegant, don't, don't require to use the We have a synchronization issue though. If you go back a few slides, you'll see that these functions print output like this. Well, it turns out that each of those independent operations can be a point where context which occurs in the threading mechanism. So if there's two separate threads running the print output, you know, one of them will print maybe the reading from here, and the second one will run and print something. And this will print a few more elements, and the next one will print a few more elements. So you get all this output in the Definitely some sort of synchronization is required here. Synchronization is kind of an important part of the threading currency. So what we'd like to do is lock some resource while those output operations occur. The most uh, brute force way to do it is have a mutex and lock it. Lock on that mutex, perform our output, release it. For the function object, lock on that mutex, perform our output, release it. Okay. That'll work, except if something goes wrong inside of any of these critical blocks of code. Then we'll end up, with, if something throws an exception here, for example, we end up with this mutex um, leaked. So rather than using manual locking and unlocking, which is kind of like um, pre-smart pointer dynamic memory allocation, imagine, right? We use a lock guard on the mutex. So this is an RAII object. It's acquiring the mutex right here. If anything goes wrong, we will make sure to release that mutex before it returns. Both the function and the function object in this type of page. So we're getting a little bit more robust to this. Last piece, returning values from threads. So to set up this example, we'll use a non, or just a single threaded example. It's also a chance to throw a little bit more of the library at you here. So let's say we want to forecast the weather, okay? Uh, so we have a set of different possible weather forecasts in text form, and then we display them. And we have a little forecast class where it's initialized with um, a forecast number which maps into one of these things. So this is all just kind of a, a basic container for different potential weather forecasts. It doesn't actually forecast anything. Then we have our function that actually predicts the weather. So like any you know, decent weather prediction mechanism, it's fully random. And so I can introduce the random number generator here um, in C++ 11. You can pick your distribution, it can be uniform, or it can be you know, bell-shaped curve, or whatever, I don't know, the of for those. Um, so you supply an initial and then final possible value and then you can also choose the engine that um, generates the random numbers based on the distribution. So the, the, the new random number generation mechanism kind of, um, separates out the engine from the distribution, which is nice. And then we go ahead and forecast the weather. So in a single thread environment, we just forecast the weather for 96 hours into the future by calling predict weather and uh, the new time functions, let us say, now plus 96 hours. So we're requesting the weather prediction. But this is a single thread. There are, this is an example of concurrency. So how do we get that value back from the function um, by running it in a separate thread, assuming it's doing more stuff uh, than just a random number? 
So future is uh, an object that can be uh, declared as a return value from a thread. And so we say um, we have a future, and the type is forecast. Right? And here's its name, and we're going to uh, get it back from a call to async. So async is just a uh, totally transparent mechanism for running a thread and returning the value from it. We don't have to understand how that's actually implemented. We can control it to a little bit of an extent. There's some additional parameters here that can say um, we really want it to be compiled immediately. We want it to be launched and sort of sequentially so we can plug it more easily and all that. But the whole idea is I'm going to capture the return value inside of this future. So this launches the thread. Presumably it'll, it'll run for a while with the other stuff. When we're ready to get the value that they return, we say the forecast, which is the object of the future, dot get. So if the thread has already completed, it'll immediately give us the forecast and we move on. If not, it'll block their waiting for that uh, return value to be computed, and then it will continue. It's like a join with a return value. Which is really and so there's a role in the notion of concurrency. One other little thing that's worth mentioning with atomics. You might think if you have an int, it's uh, multi-thread safe, right? have this global int and we're going to increment it. Incrementing is kind of a simple operation. Well, not that simple. It turns out even just incrementing a variable that has multiple CPU cycles involved, there might be a context switch between threads between one cycle and the next, and the operation will be, will be messed up. So even for a simple int uh, increment, uh, we need to do something special to make sure it's thread safe. So what we would do is declare uh, an atomic int object, and then there's special syntax for doing things like incrementing it. Sometimes you can use this, this syntax on an atomic and it would work, but it, it's deceptive. If somebody reading won't realize that there's an atomic involved, so it's better sometimes to use the library, uh, more verbose library function version of taking, taking one of these shared objects. And of course, for larger objects, atomic is more obvious to use productive. Uh, a little bit late, sorry. That's the best I could do. I think this is going to be a challenge. Um, here's some extra resources. So I'm not going to go through these all. Oh, I will mention the other section. Uh, for, for both high and low level threading, there's these two se uh, sessions by John and Tony uh, at other times. John's today, tomorrow. Low level threading, that's really nitty gritty. High level threading is kind of what I started talking about, but a lot more detail than the low level threading. That's stuff I would never have to do. Um, online references, <coughs> video presentations, tutorials, etc. I love this quote by John. There are only two kinds of languages, the ones people complain about and the ones nobody uses. So if you find things in C++11 really gratuitously confusing, they only came up, they only ended up that way because it was the only way people could agree upon how to make them useful. And they really are. So thanks. And uh, I'm not, not going to 